Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could be with us here this morning. We are um, we're in the second part of a series, and the series is based upon um, establishing or creating authentic community and relationships. And one of the things that we have worked with over the years, both in Unity and also uh, the Unity churches that I've served before up in the Northwest and even in Charlottesville, we, we worked with this. And we've adopted 12 principles to help us when we find ourselves in a place of conflict. Now, I didn't decide to start this series because I felt there was conflict, but I'm, I'm realistic to know, and one of our first principles is to recognize that in any community, in any relationship, there's going to be conflict. That's one of our number one principles. We accept that there's going to be conflict. Uh, if we somehow feel like that there's not going to be conflict, we're going to be in conflict automatically, aren't we? <laughs> so that's one of our first principles. We accept and acknowledge that conflict is a normal part of life in the church. And so the second one is then we affirm the truth. We recognize that even though there's conflict, that there's the truth of the Spirit within each and every one of us, and we work toward seeing that in each other. And that's one of our primary focuses. We endeavor to see conflict as symptomatic of what's missing in our intention to create authentic community. Uh, peacemaking is, a creative, is, is creating a pathway to God. In a very real sense, we have all been called here to be peacemakers. We may not know that, we may not realize that, but that's a big part of our spiritual purpose in this world, is learning how to be in this world with others that have different views, different ideas, different ways of seeing things, different likes, different dislikes, and learning how we can actually come into connection and community on a deeper level even with those differences doesn't mean we're going to necessarily always agree on those things, and that's the, the beauty of this, is learning how we can be in relationship and deepen a relationship with someone who has so different views than we do. And it's not an easy path. No one says it's going to be, but it's something that I, I really believe that you're here because that's part of what you recognize within yourself, that you want to experience more of that peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives my peace I give you. And it's a peace that passes understanding. I'm going to ask, Russell, would you check the thermostat again? I see people fanning out here, and I'm, maybe it's my, spirit. my it's the spirit. is the spirit, okay, well, <laughs> maybe it's the lights also, but. And then the, the, the third principle that we invite people and ask people to remind ourselves of, and uh, when, when we, um, when I, when I first came here, one of the first things I did was ask the board to look over these principles and ask them if they would be willing to work with these principles. Because we know that when we get together as a board, we have different personalities, different views, and we've been able to actually move through any kind of disagreements in a very wonderful and loving, peaceful way. And, uh, and so we use these principles, and when we, when we forget, which we have and we do at times, and I forget from time to time, we go back and we read these again, and we pray about them, and we listen. So the third thing is that we commit to prayer. We examine where we are coming from and release our need to be right. That's a big one right there. That's a big one for most of us, I think. We, we, there seems to be, in our human heart and mind, for some reason, there seems to be this need to be right. Now, being right is not a bad thing. But the need to be right is something that really blocks us in our connections and our communications and in our relationships. And so we have to really be willing to honor and look at what is that need that we have to be right. And if we hold on to that, if we're addicted to that, as I say, and I think there is in some ways it's like an addiction, that we're addicted to this need to be right. And um, it's the ability to transcend that need to be right that allows us to see things from a different perspective. It allows us to come more from our heart space. You can bet if you're in a place of a need to be right, it's not coming from your heart. It's not coming from your spirit. It really is coming from the ego consciousness. And so it doesn't mean that you're not right. It just means that if you have that need to be right and you're basically taking steps and actions and words and communicating in such a way that you are expressing that need to be right, you're not truly coming from your true nature because the true nature is your wholeness. And the wholeness, your wholeness doesn't have a need to be right. It already experiences the rightness of being. 
it experiences what in the Old Testament mostly, but even in the New Testament, it experiences righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness simply means being in alignment with the Spirit of God within us. It simply means being in harmony with that and in alignment with that. And so when we come from that place, we're able to communicate from a different perspective. In addition to that, we're able to see differently. So I came across this story. You know me, I like stories. It was a pretty lonely guy who decided life would be more fun if he had a pet. So he went down to the pet store and, and was talking to the, the pet store owner and wanted to, he wanted something kind of unusual. He wanted an unusual kind of pet. And so after some discussion, he decided on a centipede. He decided that a centipede would be a really good pet. And it came in a little box and he, and he took the little box back to his house and uh, this, you know, box was the, basically the centipede's little house and he took it and he put it in a nice place. He found a good bo a location for the box for the centipede's house and he decided he would really start off in a, with a good relationship with his new pet and so he decided he was going to take the, the pet out to dinner. And so he asked the centipede in the box, how would you like to go out to Wendy's with me for, to have dinner? Silence. Didn't hear a thing. So after no answer, he was kind of bothered by that and uh, said, well, he waited for a minute or two and then he said, uh, he decided to ask again, how would, you, how would you feel about, how would you like to go to Wendy's with me? Again, silence, nothing, didn't hear a thing. So he waited for a little bit and he was kind of thinking about the situation and he decided he was kind of getting a little bothered about it. So he decided, he decided well, I'm going to ask one more time. So he leaned down really close to the box and he shouted in the box, hey in there, would you like to go to Wendy's with me? And he heard this little voice inside that says, I heard you the first time, I'm putting on my shoes. <laughs> Well, sometimes some of us take a little longer to get ready. Isn't that true? <laughs> In lots of different ways. Not only you know, getting our shoes on, but sometimes it takes a little while for some of us to kind of get clear with how we need to respond to things. And, uh, and, so, and sometimes that's actually important. Sometimes it's valuable to prepare and to take time before we respond to things. So the, the, would you turn our projector on there, Steve? So this is a, a, the agree and disagree and covenant that we have here in unity in the heart of Austin. And it actually comes from a Mennonite uh, uh, task force that was developed, I don't remember exactly what year, but I think it was actually back in the 60s. And it's been used in a lot of different spiritual communities, both Mennonite and unity communities have used it quite a bit. Other New Thought ministries have used this. And it's just simply a reminder of ways that we can come back into alignment with our spiritual teachings, with our spiritual principles, when we're in a place where we're having disagreements and we're in a place where we're having conflicts. And I've found that it actually can be very useful in whether it's in community or in our relationships with our spouse, with our children, with our coworkers. If we can remind ourselves from the, with these things, we'll find that there are principles here that will help us move through these in a way that allows for what we call a win-win situation, where everybody is actually able to receive and experience having their needs fulfilled in a way that really works highest and best, not only for them, but also for the relationship and for the community. So the next one that we want to talk about is we go to the other. We go directly to those with whom we disagree, we avoid behind the back criticism, and we refrain from engaging in parking lot conversations. So this is actually a, a, you know, it's kind of interesting because we've been taught in this culture to, um, and I think that it's really very strong in many ways, to try to avoid conflict at all cost, haven't we? We've really been taught a lot about how that, that we shouldn't be in conflict. We, you know, we, we talk about being peacemakers, and, and yet what are the things that we uh, have been taught to do is, and oftentimes this comes in our families as we're growing up, is that if we have a disagreement with our brother or our sister, who do we go to? Do we go to our brother or sister and let them know? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we go, Mom, he's touching me. 
He punched me. He hit me. He looked at me. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so if you've grown up with that kind of energy, sometimes it's hard to let that go. Sometimes we find ourselves not going to the person that we need to deal with, but we find ourselves trying to go around. And so what really is um, valuable, I don't know about you guys, but I remember when I was a kid, if, I didn't, if mom didn't let me have what I wanted, I knew exactly who to go to. You guys know what I'm talking about? I went to daddy. And if daddy said yes, it's okay. And vice versa, if daddy said no, and I went to mom, and mom said yes, it's okay, right? So we have these kind of conditioned things from our childhood that believe it or not, at times we're still doing that. If you're real honest with yourself, you'll find at times that you find you are trying to avoid and get what your needs met, not by being direct and being clear with the person that you're, work, that you're having the challenge with, but by trying to go around. And it's not a, a, a mature way of connecting and communicating. It's actually a way of trying to avoid, but it's also, you might say, Will Bowen, who wrote this wonderful book called A Complaint-Free World, would call that a complaint. And Gary Zukov says a complaint is all complaints are basically manipulation. And so what we're really trying to do is get our needs met in an unhealthy way. We're trying to meet our needs in a way that don't really work both either for us, and it doesn't certainly work to enhance the relationship because what's going to happen, you know, when uh, the other finds out that you've gone to someone else and not to them. There's always a challenge with that, wouldn't you agree? And so one of the things that we've agreed to and commit to, in Matthew chapter 5, it's in 23 and 24, it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First make things right with your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. So I think about this in terms not only of, of giving gifts at the altar, but giving our spiritual gifts, giving of our service, giving, and we find that we're still having challenges in doing that with perhaps another person, or for that matter, even within ourselves. First go and make peace within yourself, and then bring your gifts. And what you will find is it actually is an opportunity for transformation and for discovering greater gifts. Greater gifts that can really enhance not only your experience in, in sharing and giving, but also the gifts uh, in the relationships. It can really enhance that. Thomas Akempis said, first, keep the peace within yourself, and then you can also bring peace to others. In the Course in Miracles, when we are uh, working with the Course in Miracles, one of the, the things that uh, one of the, the, the teachings of the Course in Miracles I think is the most memorable and most powerful is a, a simple phrase, and that is, I could see peace instead of this. And so ask yourself, he says, the idea today begins to describe the conditions that prevail in the other way of seeing. Peace of mind is clearly an internal matter. It must begin with your own thoughts and then extend outward. It is from your peaceful mind that a peaceful perception of the world arises. And so what Jesus is teaching here is go and make peace with the adversary. The adversary. Now in unity, uh, it, uh, Jesus talked about the adversary often, but he really wasn't necessarily talking about somebody out there. He was talking about that internal part of ourselves. The adversary really is that part of ourselves that we are having difficulty with and that we are actually putting on the faces of those out here that we are in conflict with. You follow what I'm saying about that? Carl Jung called this projection. Anybody know what about a projector? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we have things going on inside of us that we're, we're having struggles with. Maybe it's a feeling of, in, uh, of not feeling good about ourselves in some way or not feeling good about something in life. So rather than trying to get someone out here to make a change in order for us to feel okay, what we really need to do is listen for what is the need that is going on within me and what is it that I'm trying to experience so that I can feel a, a greater need and what can I do within myself to shift my awareness about that 
kind of give you some awareness. I'm, I'm going to throw out some, I'm not going to read from every one of these books, but I wanted to give some resources for those who want to really learn how to do this more effectively in life. There's a great book, actually a, a number of great books from one of, I think one of the most magnificent spiritual teachers of our time. He just passed, I think, not too long ago. I think it was last year. Marshall Rosenberg is one of my fantastic teachers, and he's taught me so much. And he's written a book called Speak Peace in a World of Conflict. And if you'd like to learn how to connect and communicate with people on a deeper level and a more deep heart-centered spiritual level, I highly recommend any of his works. But one of the things he says is that everyone, every time we're in conflict in somewhere with someone in our life, it's because there is a perception that our needs are not being met. And there are basic needs that all of us have. We all have basic needs, and those basic needs are the same with everyone. And if someone is in conflict with you, it's because they have a perception that their needs are not being met. And notice that I'm emphasizing this word perception because it's our perceptions that make us feel that our needs are not being met. And it's our perception that says someone else is causing us not to have our needs met. And that's projection. Making somebody else responsible for our needs being met. So when we go to another, we need to go to them, not with the idea that they're going to somehow change and all of a sudden our needs are going to be met. We need to go to them with an idea that there's some need that we have that we feel is not being met, and there's some need that they have that they feel is not being met. And if we can begin to ask the question, what is the message or what is the... Um, I had a phrase I was going to use here. What is the commitment behind the complaint? What is the commitment behind the complaint? We actually heard this in our, um, our uh, enlightened leadership video this last week from one, of, from one of the coaches. She said, listen for and reflect back what is the commitment behind the complaint. So someone comes to you with a complaint, listen for what it is that they are committed to. So we have a tendency to go and uh, hear the complaint, but not really listen to what the underlying desire or commitment is for. So we hear what's wrong, but on the other side of that, there automatically is something that they are desiring, right? And so what we're really learning to do is train ourselves to listen, not so much to focus on what is wrong, but listen for what, what is it that's being asked for here? What's the underlying request? <clears throat> Marshall also talks about this idea of learning to make requests as opposed to making complaints. There's a wonderful, another resource for you, Complaint-Free Relationships. You can start with the book Complaint-Free World by Will Bowen. We did a series on that, oh gosh, a couple years ago. Maybe it's maybe get time to do another one. But um, Will Bowen has just come up with a, a fantastic practice for learning how to be in the world in more peaceful ways and in more deep relationships with each other by looking at how our patterns of communications and the ways that we are complaining about life as opposed to focusing on and requesting what it is that we want and need. We've been taught in order to get what we want and need, the best thing to do is go and gripe about it, right? But the reality is when we focus on what we don't like, we're actually putting more energy into what it is that we don't like. And we actually are going to be a part of that creative process. We're created in the image and after the likeness of that creative process. It's ongoing. And the more energy we put into what we don't like, we actually are going to experience more of what we don't like. But rather than focusing on what we don't like, we need to shift our energy and focus on what is the underlying desire or request that's in that complaint. And if we can focus on that, we will draw to us more of the experiences that we truly want to experience in our life. 
we will move more into experiencing and using our creative energy to bring about a greater experience of the possibilities in our life. It's a shift in energy, it's a shift in, in habits, it's a shift in practice, but it really does help us to focus more on what it is that is the underlying desire and need of that experience. So when we go to another, actually let me back up a second here, talking about when we have a, 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 a challenge or a difficulty or a complaint, we have a tendency not to go to the person that we have the complaint with. We tend to go to everybody else. We do this in relationships sometimes. We go to, uh, let's say if we have a, a problem with our, with our spouse, we sometimes will find ourselves going to other family members and letting them know about this problem. And that's, that's just not healthy in a relationship. We tend to go to moms and dads or we go to brothers and sisters. Sometimes we go to our children and, and complain about their dad or their mom. This is really not a healthy way of connecting in a relationship, folks. So really you want to uh, honor the connection and the relationship that they have with each other and not do that. Uh, coworkers. Anybody ever had a coworker you had difficulty with? <laughs> One of the first things that we do want to do is, is be able to go to that coworker and express what's going on for us about that. But there's a way of doing that. It's not to go there with the idea of making them wrong and getting them to change so that they meet our needs. In the second step, we talk about going, let me find my place here. The second thing that we do up here you can see, we go in the spirit of humility. We go in gentleness, patience, and humility. We own our part in the conflict instead of blaming others and acting as if others are responsible for how we are. And I looked up the word humility, and it is the quality or state of thinking you are better than other people. It's the quality and state of being humble. So anytime you go to someone in a conflictual situation with the idea that you're right, they're wrong, you know better, you're better than they are, or for that matter, even if you do the opposite, to be honest, if you go the opposite and say, I'm wrong, they're right, the reality is you're still coming from the ego place because it's the ego that does this up and down game. I'm up here, you're down here, or you're up here and I'm down here. You come with a sense of, and a few weeks ago we had a wonderful daily word called equanimity. Equanimity simply means that you are in the energy of equality with, with something or someone. And so you go with a spirit of humility, and humility, humbleness, the word humble really simply means to be teachable, that you're open to learning that you're open to transformation, you're open to growing. So the idea is not to go there and change the other person, but to go there and learn what it is that you need to learn for you to be able to come into a place of harmony and peace within yourself. So we have these challenges and difficulties, I think, primarily to draw forth from within us how we can actually be more at peace within ourselves. And if we use it for that, come with a spirit of openness and willing to, to, willingness to learn how we can be in connection and relationship with each other more deeply, deeply, then it draws forth resources from within us that we didn't even know we had sometimes. It'll help us to draw on the possibilities that allow us to step and look beyond our own perceptions and perspectives of how things are supposed to be. Last week I talked about uh, this idea, one of my, my best friends, and still is a great example, one of my best friends is a, is a counselor and he did, does, has done a lot of marital counseling and one of the first things he does with a couple is ask the couple to describe their house. But he'll have one of the couple, the husband say, see themselves at the front of the house and the other one at the back of the house and they'll ask, he'll ask them to describe what they're seeing. And each one gives a different description. From this, of the same house. And he asked them which one is right. And of course the truth is they're both right, but they're simply seeing it from a different perception. And if we can recognize when we have conflicts and differences, it's just like that. 
someone else has a perception from their point of view that sees things that we perhaps don't see. And maybe we have things that they don't see, and they may or may not be willing to see it. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn to see from other people's perceptions. And when we do, we find ourselves moving more into a place of humility. We're open to learning possibilities. Eric Butterworth says, peacemaking is not a thing you have to do in the world around you. In the most dramatic way, the world around you will, ch be, will be changed in the twinkling of an eye as you change. An electric light doesn't have to go out into the room to try to sweep away the darkness. When the light is turned on, the light radiates and the darkness disappears. It's as simple as that, but it's not easy. So this is really a big part of our spiritual work, both in spiritual community, but in all of our relationships, is learning how to turn the light on, not necessarily sweep the darkness away. The more we can focus on turning on that light, the more we will be able to experience that connection that we have on a deeper level. There was a young man that was sitting at a stoplight in downtown New Orleans one evening, and when the lady in front of him was distracted, she was going through some papers on her front seat, and the red light changed to green, and the young woman didn't move. She just sat there. And the young man was he was a bit put off by that and gently bumped his horn to remind her that she was driving and not to be in the library of it or her office there in her front seat. Um, but even as that gentle reminder, she didn't move. She, she just stayed there. Before he knew it, the light turned from yellow, green to yellow and then to red. And he was getting pretty upset about that. And so the lady just still didn't move, was set there. So, you know, the young man rolled down his window, but actually, before he rolled down his window, he actually found himself yelling and screaming at her at the top of his lungs, beating his fist on the steering wheel. And he was shocked when he heard a knock on the window, and so he rolled down his window, and there was a policeman there with his gun drawn and tapping on the window. The policeman told him to step out of the car, and he handcuffed the man, and he was putting him in the back of the patrol car, and the young man just was in disbelief. He began to, well, you can't arrest me for screaming at her from inside my car. And the patrolman looked at him and told him, just be quiet and get in the car. And after taking him downtown to the station, two hours in the cell, the holding cell, the officer came and he told the young man, okay, you're free to go. And the man said, well, why did you, you know, why did you arrest me? You're in trouble now. I'm, I'm calling my lawyer. What is this all about? I, I would, you can't arrest me for throwing a screaming fit in my own car. You haven't heard the last of this. And the police officer just calmly responded and said, Sir, we're not arresting you for shouting and throwing a fit in your car. You see, I was sitting directly behind you at the light, and I saw you screaming and beating on your steering wheel. And I said to myself, Man, what the, this jerk... There's nothing I can do to him for throwing a fit in his own car. And then I noticed the unity wings on your mirror, and the peace begins with me bumper sticker on the back of your car, and I thought, this car has got to be stolen. And I, that's why you were arrested. <laughs> so, you know, we can put wings on our... Uh, our, our car, we can, you know, put our bumper sticker, peace begins with me. And the work really is learning to practice that, learning to practice that and learning to be in a place where we are, even when we do find ourselves in those places where we're just feeling really angry and frustrated, those are the opportunities that we have for deeper spiritual connection, for deeper spiritual growth, opportunities to, to try to understand what is it that we're really wanting and needing ourselves and what perhaps is this other person really wanting and needing? And where is the connection between those? Where is the coming together? And where can, where's the, what we call the sweet spot where we do meet and are able to both come to a place of having our needs met? That's an opportunity. So I came across another story, and I want. It was uh, the last 
One is that we are, we're quick to listen. We listen carefully, summarizing and checking out what is heard before responding. We seek as much to understand as to be understood. We seek as much to understand as to be understood. So when we go to the other, the, the idea is not to go there so that we can, they make sure that we, they understand what our point is and our, our way of seeing things. Does that make sense? You go to them with the idea of trying to understand what's their point of view, and then you open yourself to the possibility that they may actually be willing to hear your point of view. We have a tendency to immediately think that when we have a conflict, the most important thing is for us to be heard, right? Hey, come on, cough it up. It's a, it's a hairball, you know, just... That's what the ego does. We all got that. Our, most, we, we, our energy is really about making sure that we're heard. And the reason why we feel like we need to be heard is because somehow we feel like that we aren't or haven't been. But the reality is if we really tune into that place within us where we are connected with our true nature, that we actually don't even need to be heard. Think about that for a moment. We're okay even if they never ever hear what we're trying to say. If we can get to that place of recognizing that we're safe, we're secure, even if they are not hearing what we're trying to say, and we come from more of a place of peace, what we're doing is opening a window in the possibilities for them to hear from a different place, from a different place of peace. If we're coming with the idea that we're going to make sure that they hear what we have to say, we probably immediately uh, uh, met with a wall of resistance. Make sense? So go with the idea of hearing and listening, and listening from a place of the heart, as we talked about a few weeks ago, listening from a place within ourselves, and seek to find out and understand as much, if not more so, than trying to be understood. In James chapter 119, know this, my dear brother and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person doesn't produce God's righteousness. That anger is really not helping us to move into a, a, an alignment with our source, with our true nature, with our being. Doesn't mean we're not going to get angry, but when we find ourselves in the place, the work is to actually move back into that place where we're experiencing more of our peace and our wholeness. There was a lady who was doing some Saturday afternoon baking, and there was a knock at the door, and she went and then found the man there that was dressed in shabby work clothes and looking for odd jobs. He asked her if she had any work for him, and she said, Well, can you paint? Well, he said, yeah, I can paint. I'm a rather good painter. And he says, well, okay, there, there's two gallons of green paint there and a brush, and there's a Porsche, uh, porch out back and needs to be painted. And please do a good job. I'll pay you what the job is worth when you're done. And he said, that's great. I'll be done quickly. And he went back to her baking, and she went back to her day baking, and he didn't, she didn't think much more about it until there was another knock at the door, and he, she came to the door, and he said, well, I'm finished. And she said, well, did you do a good job? Oh, yes, I did a very good job. But I need to let you know, ma'am, that that's not a Porsche back there. That's, that's a Mercedes. <laughs> it's important to have clear communication <laughs> in our relationships. And so a big part of having clear communication is listening very deeply. Listening not only to the words that are being said, but listening underneath to what are the needs that are being expressed. If we can really listen more to what, what are the needs that are underlying the request, then what we'll find that our communication is clearer. And when it's not clear, then we go to the other person for clarification. We go to the other person to help us understand what's being expressed and what, what is really uh, at the heart of what's being said. So even though there may be anger, frustration, resentment being expressed, if we can hear deeper than that, we will find that ultimately what that person is wanting is to experience being safe, being loved, being secure, 
being fulfilled in some way that they're not feeling at that moment. And so I want to close with one of my favorite prayers. It's a prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying, it is in dying that we are born again to abundant life. I invite you to take that prayer with you this week. Hold that in your heart and think about that as you move into all of your relationships in life and see if that doesn't help shift the awareness, the energy for you in such a way that things actually work out more harmoniously, more peacefully, and more lovingly in all aspects of your life. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. And so it is. Let's move into our meditation time. All right, well, let's fly away inside. Yeah. Turn within for a moment. Take a nice Woo. deep breath. Just breathe into that heart space and just let yourself feel the energy and the freedom of that awareness, that expression. I'll fly away. Flying away with the, the wings of a snow white dove is an old, another old song. And a dove is a symbol of that peace that passes all understanding. So let's just allow ourselves to be a part of, to listen to, to move into that space within us where we know and feel that peace that passes understanding beyond our intellect, beyond our ego consciousness, beyond our need to be right, beyond our addiction to our perceptions, beyond the differences that we sometimes see beyond our disagreements. There's a place where we come together in heart and mind and spirit. Let your heart be open to feel that knowing of that one presence, that one power, God. And know that that God is love. God is love. God is spirit. And they that worship in spirit and truth and love. Be open now and receptive. Be willing. Be open and humble to be taught. What is the message of these differences? What are the gifts? What am I here to learn? What am I here to share and express? Am I open to listening deeply from the heart? Am I open to expanding that heart connection? Am I willing to learn and grow through this experience? Take now a nice deep breath. Breathe into that heart space. Give thanks 
with this opportunity to deepen spiritual connection, to deepen our awareness of being in authentic relationship. And so it is. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Be present here and now in this space and give thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, blessed spirit.